Welcome to Weekly Space News from Ad Astra. I'm Swapna Krishna. This week, we're going to talk about a bright new star, as bright as Polaris, that's going to appear in our night sky, how to de-ice a telescope from a million miles away, what a map of a million black holes looks like, and how you can see a devil comet. Let's start with the water ice problem on a very sensitive telescope. The ESA, or European Space Agency, has to de-ice the Euclid telescope that's located a million miles or 1.5 million kilometers away. The observatory, which is designed to study the mysteries of the dark universe, dark matter and dark energy, has tiny layers of water ice affecting its ability to observe light with its visible instrument. These are tiny, about the width of a strand of DNA. So now the question is, how do you de-ice a telescope from a million miles or 1.5 million kilometers away? I want to first make it clear that this is a common and expected problem with space-based telescopes. This isn't an indication something has broken or gone wrong. I've seen some headlines suggesting as such, and I don't want to contribute to that. But it's interesting to highlight, I think, that this is something science and engineering teams do have to deal with. So the first logical question is, this is space. Where does the water come from? Well, it's water that was introduced through the air during the telescope's assembly on Earth. Now that Euclid is in the cold, dark vacuum of space, the components are releasing minuscule amounts of water. It's generally not a problem, unless the water ice ends up on the mission's optical instruments, which is what happened. This is an anticipated problem, which is why Euclid underwent an outgassing after launch. The team warmed up the observatory using its heaters and the sun. This took care of any water molecules near Euclid's surface, sublimating them into space. But there were additional molecules trapped in the spacecraft's insulation, which surrounds the telescope, that is now being released as water ice. Scientists first observed this problem because they saw a gradual decline in the amount of photons coming into Euclid's visible instrument. They compared these readings to previous ones taken both by Euclid and Gaia, and because this was an expected problem, they determined that the water ice was the culprit. Now, if Euclid weren't such a sensitive telescope, maybe this wouldn't be a problem, but because even a few nanometers of ice is affecting it, it's time to de-ice. One option was to repeat the outgassing procedure that Euclid experienced after launch, just turn on all the heaters and melt the ice. But the problem is, that would heat the entire spacecraft. It wouldn't take too long to cool the spacecraft back down, a week or so, but it could result in a slightly different optical alignment. With such a sensitive telescope, the ESA wanted to see if they could come up with a different solution to avoid weeks or possibly even months of recalibration. Instead, they decided to strategically warm up Euclid, flipping on individual heaters to see if that cleared the problem. The hope was that they could warm up specific low-risk parts of the spacecraft, which wouldn't affect the visible instrument's alignment and regain the vision the instrument has lost. The good news is that after just one day of this, Euclid appeared to be back to normal. The ESA is going to analyze the results and give more in-depth updates later, but this is a great sign, especially as this will continue to be a problem over Euclid's lifetime. And they may have just found a great and efficient way to deal with this issue without affecting the rest of the spacecraft. It's worth noting that Euclid is out at Lagrange Point 2, the same place that JWST is. So why isn't this an issue for JWST? That's because JWST is an infrared optimized telescope and isn't designed to observe the universe in visible light. Euclid operates in both visible and infrared. This means that JWST is much, much colder than Euclid. It is so cold that even the coldness of space isn't enough. The mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, has its own separate cooling system. When JWST started its cool-down procedure, the team used heaters to strategically warm parts of the spacecraft and keep them warmer than the cold side structures. That was in order to prevent any water ice from forming. Once the cold side was fully cooled, they then begin cooling the rest of the observatory. Critically, JWST does not have the same kind of insulation that Euclid has on its cold side where the instruments are. There is insulation, but it's on the side with the solar panels, and there is a giant sunshield in between the two. 
That's why this isn't as big of an issue for JWST. T. Corona Borealis is located about 3,000 light years away, and it's a star with a magnitude of 10 in our night sky. That means it's not visible to the unaided eye from Earth. But it's going to get a lot brighter. The star system is what's called a recurrent nova on an 80 year cycle. This is a rare phenomenon, and scientists are still trying to figure out exactly what the mechanisms are behind it. Every 80 years, this star begins increasing in brightness and then decreases. Then, 11 months later, it explodes and becomes much, much brighter. This brightness lasts a few days, though peak brightness only lasts for about 12 hours, before the cycle starts all over again. It's been documented since the year 1217 CE, and the last time we witnessed the explosion was in the year 1946. So, what might cause a star to explode over and over again on a regular cycle? The prevailing theory is that it's due to the fact that the T Corona Borealis system is a binary with a white dwarf and a red giant. A white dwarf is what a star like our sun will become one day after it burns itself out. A dense, hot core with a mass like our sun, but packed into the size of Earth. A red giant, meanwhile, is also a star like our sun, but one that's moved off the main sequence in the later stages of its life. They're huge, red, and relatively cool. As an aside, there are around 400 known novas in the Milky Way, and what they all have in common is that one of the stars is a white dwarf. These two stars are packed relatively close together, which means that the white dwarf is collecting mass from the red giant. Remember, the white dwarf is already very dense, so this continues to build pressure, and eventually the hydrogen explodes. Unlike a supernova, though, the star isn't destroyed, just the material stolen from its red giant neighbor. Then the cycle starts all over again. Scientists think that T. Corona Borealis could explode any time between now and September because the star was seen brightening in 2015 and then dipping in brightness in April 2023. But the explosion could happen as late as next year. We don't know, but we have to keep an eye on the sky. It will appear in the Corona Borealis constellation that's surrounded by Hercules and Bootes. If you want to know more about the night sky, you can check out my book Stargazing, available wherever you buy books. When it explodes, the star will be as bright as Polaris in our night sky. Speaking of the sky, this week scientists released a map of 1.3 million active black holes across the universe. Called quasars, these are some of the brightest objects in the universe thanks to the luminous gas and dust that surrounds them in an accretion disk. I even did a video in one of my news roundups on what might be the brightest object in the universe, an active galactic nucleus, so check that out if you're interested. So what does this kind of map look like? Here it is. The holes in the map are where the Milky Way's disk blocks our view. This map is unique because it's three-dimensional and it was built using data from the European Space Agency's Gaia telescope. Gaia's mission is to map the Milky Way, but thanks to its careful, methodical scanning, it also detects objects outside our galaxy like these active black holes. Scientists were able to use the secondary data from Gaia to create this map. But the original data from Gaia contained 6.6 .6 million quasar candidates. They had to narrow it down and confirm both that they were in fact quasars and the distance to these quasars to create the map. If you want to read up on the process, the paper is in the Astrophysical Journal. It's important to note, this might not be the largest map ever compiled, but it's the biggest by volume of the universe. Scientists have already used this map to study how the universe has expanded by looking at CMB, or cosmic microwave background, which is the first light of the universe after the Big Bang. Now here's some interesting launch news, or lack thereof. Expedition 70, with two cosmonauts, and NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson was supposed to launch this morning, Thursday, March 21st, from Baikonur Cosmodrome, but it didn't. There was an abort at the 22nd mark before launch. Attention. Attention on the launch. Automatic abort of launch has gone through. Now, I know launch aborts are normal, but this is really, really rare for a Soyuz. They're certainly old technology, but they're very reliable. And there have been issues in the past, but it's never really during the launch countdown. 
I'm not gonna say this is unprecedented because I am not familiar with every single crude Soyuz launch, but I am very comfortable saying that this is not normal. It wasn't due to weather. And for a while, all we knew was that the cosmonauts and the astronaut were safe. We found out a couple of hours later that the issue was, quote, a voltage drawdown of a chemical power source. So basically lower than expected power levels. Nothing too alarming, but it's just honestly weird to have an abort on a Soyuz launch sequence. There's a minimum of a 24 hour recycle on Soyuz hardware. So there's another launch opportunity Saturday at 8.36 AM Eastern time. Hopefully they will get off the ground safely at that point. But here's some good news. The Veritas mission to Venus is apparently back after losing most of its funding in NASA's fiscal year 2024 budget. This is a mission to map Venus's surface to study why its planetary development was so different from Earth's. Last week, I broke down some aspects of NASA's fiscal year 2025 budget request and talked about the bad news that unless something changed, the very important Chandra X-ray observatory would basically be canceled. But there's some good news hidden in the planetary science budget. Veritas, the mission to Venus, appears to be back. Veritas was chosen in 2021 as a discovery mission, which is NASA's program for smaller, lower cost solar system exploration missions. It's designed to orbit Venus. It was scheduled for 2027, but in late 2022, NASA delayed the mission by three years. Basically, an independent review board uncovered problems with another mission, Psyche, which ended up launching in October of 2023. These were primarily due to understaffing and a lack of oversight at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. They needed funding from Veritas to address the Psyche delay, so they delayed the Venus mission. This doesn't seem like a huge deal, except the delay was three years long, and Psyche has already launched at this point. NASA did provide some funding for the science staff of the mission, but Veritas was losing its engineering staff to other projects. It took 12 years for this mission to come together with this particular set of personnel, and they were losing them because of NASA JPL's institutional issues. Basically, just not a great situation all around. Well, now the good news. Veritas is back in NASA's planetary science budget. This supports a launch date of 2031 or 2032, which is amazing news because the U.S. hasn't sent a spacecraft to specifically study Venus since NASA's Magellan in 1990. The ESA did send Venus Express, which arrived in 2006 and had a fruitful eight-year mission. Now let's go back to our night sky. Did you know you can see the Horned Devil Comet right now? And it will stick around and might give us a great show during the April 8th eclipse? It's less ominous than it sounds. The comet is called 12P Pons Brooks, and it's currently visible with a pair of binoculars. Soon, you'll be able to see it with the unaided eye. This comet's nucleus is estimated to be 10.5 miles or 17 kilometers across, and it's been nicknamed the Devil Comet because of how it looks. Pons Brooks has regular flares and brightness, and last July, it had an outburst of gas and dust that made it 100 times brighter. The gas surrounding its nucleus, called a coma, expanded. Some thought it looked like the devil's horns, hence the name Devil Comet. We don't really know why Pons Brooks occasionally flares in brightness, but one hypothesis is pretty cool. Studying a different comet, 29P Schwassmann Walkman, Astronomer Richard Miles said the outbursts might be the product of ice volcanoes, spewing frozen gases instead of lava into space. Miles thinks they occur because as a comet rotates during the day, its crust weakens and then carbon monoxide builds up overnight. Pressure builds, and then it's eventually released through these cryoeruptions. The comet will reach perihelion, which is when it's closest to the sun, in late April, at which point it will be a magnitude of 4. That means it will be visible to the unaided eye. Now, where it gets interesting is that this means it would be near the sun when totality hits on April 8, 2024, across North America. If you're in the path of the total eclipse, it is very possible you will be able to see both the solar eclipse and this comet in the sky. And that is about all the news I have for you this week. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.